Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, Principal Atmospheric Scientist at Nutrient Ag Solutions, and I want to thank you for giving me some time today to talk to you about our midsummer weather and where we're taking the end of this growing season. Let's get right into it by talking about how this growing season really got going, because back in May, it was a relatively cool one and a wet one. And that was interesting because we came off of a warm and wet winter to finally get the weather patterns we thought we'd see in winter during our planting time period. Now, because of the cooler and wetter conditions, we actually saw quite a bit of cloud cover. When measured here, we can see that during the month of May, we had a deficit overall in our cumulative downward solar flux. In other words, how much sunlight got down to the plant canopy. And across much of the Corn Belt, including a big chunk of Missouri here, the extra clouds prevented a lot of that early sunlight from helping the crop really jump out of the ground. We had another problem too, and that was a very, very late freeze. Back on May the 7th through May the 12th, we had a shot of colder air that really raced through the eastern part of the United States, bringing freezing temperatures as far south as North Carolina. And it really hit the eastern Corn Belt pretty hard. The state of Missouri avoided a lot of this sub-freezing air though, which overall uh, tended to be a very good thing seeing that we had quite a bit of crop damage in the eastern part of the Corn Belt. But one thing we all suffered from this early growing season was very strong wind events. What you're looking at here was a circulation called Tropical Storm Cristobal that was right here that came out of the Yucatan Peninsula, and then a second backside low that came down here out of the High Plains and met right over the state of Missouri. Cristobal was a pretty rare event, an early season tropical cyclone that began here in the Yucatan Peninsula and went right through parts of New Orleans and then came through Missouri all the way up here and eventually landed itself in Canada. As it came through through it produced some very heavy rain and also some very windy conditions. You can see here from this satellite animation, those two separate low pressure systems, the second one on the back side over here now bringing in all the smoke and dust, which then made its way through Missouri on some very, very strong winds. In fact, we saw through from mid-May through mid-June some of the windiest conditions we've seen in the central United States since we've been keeping record. On average, this is what this map is showing you here, on average, we were six to 10 miles an hour per day, six to 10 miles an hour uh, faster per day when looking at that time period of May uh, 17th through June the 16th. It made for pretty tough conditions here in the midsection of the United States. This was in your neighboring state of Kansas. The guy decided to pour himself a beer with these strong straight line winds and could barely get it done. And also in Kansas, I got a video here of what is now, I know, a giant tank rolling across the road in these winds. I thought it was a round bale at first, but as you can see here, it is a tank that was moving across there. Speaking of those winds, let me outline something for you here. That is one of the largest dust plumes ever measured coming off of the Sahara Desert. And we had here at the end of June that huge plume of dry, dusty air, so much uh, dust in it, we could actually see it very clearly from the International Space Station. As that dust got to Puerto Rico, you can see how much it degraded the air quality. The image on the top was when it was full of dust. The image on the bottom is normal. So this really, really chopped away at our air quality. And as that dust plume came working its way through the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, as we got here toward the 27th of June, one of those plumes pushed all the way up into the state of Missouri. Now we had some pretty brilliant sunsets from it, but that's about all the benefit it has. Because after we saw some of that dust land on our cars and in places, we could swipe it up and take a look at what was in it. It turns out that what this dust is primarily made of is clay and feldspar, so no good uh, mineralogy to it, no good value if it were to get precipitated into your fields. Now let's get to some stats. June. This map shows you average temperature ranks by climate district. So when you look at this particular map, we see that during the month of June, the cooler weather was down here to our south and east, and it was warmer to our north and west. Tucked right in the middle there was Missouri, and we saw a warmer than average month of June. Now watch this. Go to July, the heat was in the southwest and the northeast, and the cooler weather was here, stretching toward the north and west, but still right in the middle of Missouri, we saw, on average, a warmer than normal July as well. But it was the July precipitation that I think a lot of folks will remember. This is where we rank on July precipitation. Remember, the closer you get to the number one, the wetter it was, the closer you get to 128, the drier. That means there's 128 years in this data set. We look across the state of Missouri and we see uh, wetter than average conditions in some locations to much above average precipitation, especially in the northern part of the state. Look at your neighbor just to the north though, there in Iowa. Some pockets in central Iowa having one of their driest Julys on record 
and there are some places in there that went 45 days without precipitation and that's a big section of the Corn Belt to be having deal with very dry conditions during the critical month of July. Over the last week, we added a lot to this. So as we began the month of uh, August, you can see that there are places in the state of Missouri that saw better than six inches of rainfall just in the last seven days alone. And some of these slow moving storms really soaked this section of the Corn Belt uh, getting over into other parts of the Ohio Valley as it moved off to the east. Now, where's our precipitation coming from in the near term? Well, a lot of the action is going to be out to the east. You see there uh, what is currently Tropical Storm Isaias that is moving through uh, parts of the Carolinas. And as it does so, putting out some very heavy rainfall. For us back in the midsection of the country, though, we have a pretty dry week on tap here. Maybe our next chance at precip coming through with some storms late in the week and possibly over uh, Friday night into Saturday. But you notice it's just thunderstorms at this point. We're not calling for excessive amounts of rainfall as we progress through about the 11th and 12th of the month. Beyond that, though, take a look at what the jet stream's doing. You ready? As I draw on the map on the left, this is the overall position and flow of the jet stream. That's from the GFS model. European has a very similar path to its jet stream as well, which means the models are in pretty good agreement through mid-month. And what do they agree about? This large ridge that's sitting here over the southwest. Now, what we could potentially be getting out of this is flow that comes around that ridge, so the high-pressure cells here, flow that comes around that ridge from the northwest. And if that's the case, what this would often kick off is a relatively stormy pattern for us. So the GFS model, looking at week two, which again takes us from the 10th of August to the 17th, is showing stormy conditions here with the heat back here under the ridge. What do we get from the ECMWF? Actually a very similar pattern overall with the heat and dryness back farther to the west. Now, talking about temperatures, take a look at the next five days. So this is the third through the eighth. The flow pattern right now features something like this, a big ridge cutting into a deep trough. And the cooler weather that's tucked away in that trough is giving us a chilly start to the month of August. Both models seeing it very clearly. But as we just talked about, with time, the ridge builds back to the west and starts to bring the heat back in toward the end of this weekend. And as we look out to that time period of the 8th through the 13th, we see both models agreeing on the return to above average temperatures. And that's tending to last as we get all the way out here to the middle of the month, all the way out to the 18th. So we're going to just enjoy the cooler weather for a little while at the beginning of August and then go right back over to just seeing our normal summer temperatures and daily thunderstorm activity. What about longer term? Well, let's turn our attention here to week three and week four. So the time period, the 17th through the 23rd, and then the 24th through the 30th. Over the weekend, I watched the models trend much warmer in the midsection of the United States than what they had been advertising. We are now expecting that the end of the month of August finishes with near average to above average temperatures. One thing that is not changing, though, is the transport of moisture out of the Gulf of Mexico. And we can see that over both of those weeks, the models are continuing to put down a stormy path through the midsection section of the country, including the state of Missouri. So if we had to look at this, we would say that the models are suggesting that after this cool time period comes through, a warmer and wetter, hotter and stormier time period is on tap as we progress through the month of August. Now, longer term, we're going to have to look at this map. What it shows us is as we begin the month of August, what our ocean temperatures look like across the center Pacific. And you see this in through here? That is our weekly developing La Nina, those cold waters. It's having trouble because of how warm the water is in the North Pacific, and these two things are fighting against one another. I'll show you how bad it's been. You see, to get a La Nina, you need to average water temperatures below this line right here, minus 0.5 degrees Celsius. We got there at the end of May, but then warmed back up into July and have slowly been cooling back down in that direction as we work our way here into uh, August. But this La Nina is not strong by any means, and nor is it forecast to be strong. So with the weak La Nina that we're going to be getting later this fall, plus the warmer than average temperatures here in the North Pacific, well, this is an extremely rare combination and difficult to find a good analog year. It appears that through the month of August and early September, we're going to stay with our warmer pattern and possibly stormier pattern. But later on in the year, well, La Nina's typically correlate with warm, dry falls. So we'll keep an eye on that. But don't forget this, La Ninas are also well correlated with more tropical cyclones, which means we could be getting more action like we've been seeing out of the Atlantic. And if one of these systems should come up the gut of the Mississippi River, it could produce some very heavy rainfall across the state of Missouri. Not saying it's going to happen, but with a weak La Nina like this, it is certainly a possibility. Elsewhere around the world, 
This map shows you through the middle of the month of August what we're anticipating in terms of precipitation for Europe. Now, through the month of July, we saw drought develop in parts of France and in Germany. And you notice that over the next 15 days or so, it's going to be dry there as well. North of the Black Sea, which is right here, we see that Ukraine is forecast to be drier than normal as well as some heat builds in. Why is that heat coming in? Big ridge going over Scandinavia. So all the storms are going to be down there on the southern side of the Alps near the Aegean Sea. And you can see this is the wet pocket here. But when we talk about the competition with the crops that we grow in the state of Missouri, it's France, Germany, and of course, Ukraine. I'll put a U in it right there so you know which country that I'm talking about. From there, I would like to take you over to China. Now, as you watch the video on the right, this is one of the spillways uh, on one of the major dams that uh, blocks up the Yangtze River. And you can see just the tremendous amount of water that is flowing through this. Over the last 45 days, look at the map in the upper left-hand corner. This particular region has received an enormous amount of rainfall, some locations 25 inches greater than average. Well, there's a lot of pressure right now on the Three Gorges Dam, and there is a lot of question as to whether or not the dam is able to hold back the tremendous amount of water that is pushing up against it. Now, it was an incredible engineering feat, but we have to wait and see it by watching some of the news reports as to whether or not the dam is allowed to uh, release a lot of that water and therefore not break. But what does that mean for the half billion people that live downstream of it as you get over towards Shanghai because over the next 10 days that watershed which I'm kind of outlining right here is forecast to be very wet again so uh, we're seeing additional precipitation fall on already saturated ground and it looks to not be letting up that's going to be a major news story as we progress through the month of August now let's come back to that temperature uh, picture of the oceans here and I want to instead focus right in this area just lately we've seen quite a bit of warm excuse me, cold water, cold water emerged there. Now we call that area Nino region 1.2. Okay, it's right next to South America. And this morning I did a little bit of research on what it means to see uh, water different than normal in terms of its temperature there. And this is what we found. When the waters there are warmer than average, it tends to be wet in Brazil's central growing area. The correlation is relatively strong. Now, if the waters are cool there, which we just saw they are, okay, that means this correlation is opposite of what I showed you here, which means it would be dry in this area. Now, it's the normal dry season for Brazil, but the question is always how dry is it and how dry is it going to get? Because we've taken a look here at the root zone soil moisture from satellite, and we can see that a big section of Brazil is really struggling with very, very dry conditions, and this is compared to average. So it is drier than average during their dry season. And as a result of that, we've seen a lot of fire activity. This is a, a, a website that shows you based on satellite observations, they put red dots where there are currently active fires in Brazil. And what I want you to think about is in central Brazil right now, there are a lot of brush fires and pasture fires that, like we saw a couple of years ago, can really delay the start of a growing season. So if all that fire activity is in place, that means the soil is very dry and they won't plant that first crop of soybeans until they get the moisture back in the soil to help the seed germinate. So we need to watch this very, very carefully. Also, we need to watch the uh, Amazon to the north as well, because some high resolution data here from the satellite Sentinel captured some of the burning here in the Amazon where they are continuing to find acres. Brazil is going to be a major story coming up this year due to the anticipated large increase in acreage. And we're going to watch it very carefully and I'll keep you posted. OK, I appreciate your attention. Hopefully this answered a few questions for you as we finish up this month of August and look forward to harvest. But watch out for that La Nina. And with that, I'll go ahead and leave it right here. Thank you for your attention. Have a great one.